Hello and welcome to Dialogues from Facebook on the sidelines of the Ricina Dialogue 2019 in New Delhi. In this session, we're going to be discussing counterterrorism and methods of cooperation. And joining me in the discussion is Sandra Hain, a researcher in terrorism and radicalization at the Austrian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you, Sandra, for being here. Um, given the nature of terrorist groups today, such as the Islamic State, that are truly global in nature, is it possible for nation states to have individual unique counterterrorism strategies? Or does global jihad have such a universal cross-cultural dimension that it requires international policy recommendations? Thank you very much for having me. Um, well, terrorism is a global phenomenon, but it is very much embedded in regional contexts. Mm -hmm. um, be it on a meso level, meaning the desire of terrorist organizations to change certain domestic or foreign policies of states, or be it on a micro level, meaning the desire of individuals mm -hmm. uh, to change the status quo of their own lives. Uh, that may be because of feelings of grievance, oppression, uh, because of marginalization or injustice. So what underlies terrorism uh, is, uh, is the rational or strategic choice to change, uh, to use terrorism to change a certain uh, status quo. And um, so the regional contexts often differ, but the underlying causes are more or less the same. And um, this is where international cooperation can, can take place. Um, apart from governmental measures, like intelligence sharing uh, or the countering of financial flows of mm -hmm. terrorism, uh, we can of course cooperate on an academic level um, that addresses the radicalization uh, within projects that address the radicalization of the civic society. Um, yeah, we could share the findings and so on. Yeah. Um, one of the facts which sort of gets overlooked or ignored when discussing counterterrorism strategies is that every successful terrorist group has to be receiving some sort of support or patronage from somewhere else. So if we look at the US and NATO and their strategies in Afghanistan against the Taliban, while you can have a military strategy, what is often ignored is that one, ideology is extremely resilient and you can't defeat that ideology, and two, it's Pakistan who is backing the Taliban. So why is it that, how can we begin to discuss cooperation when you have, without addressing these problems of state sponsorship of terrorism? Well, state sponsorship of terrorism is um, very much a problem. I mean, uh, such foreign policies, meaning states that support states that support terrorism, um, is problematic because it fuels terrorism in several ways. Firstly, it leads to the radicalization of people effect, affected by such foreign policies, for example, the victims of terrorism. Secondly, it leads to the radicalization of fellows around the globe that uh, have a feeling of vicarious grievance um, and would like to be to get um, to take action um, for that cause. And thirdly, it of course encourages states that are supported by other states to stick to their foreign policies, which fuels f terrorism further. When we talk about terrorism, it's, it's an evolving threat. We've seen at the start where we had Al-Qaeda, if Al-Qaeda was considered sort of Jihad 1.0 and it had extremely unique characteristics. And then if you consider the Islamic State as Jihad 2.0, where they might have uh, a foundational aspect of having a caliphate or an Islamic community, Islamic state. Um, what does the future of global jihad of terrorism look like? And then how, how can states think ahead and combat it? Well, as we saw the underlying causes, and as I already mentioned, the underlying causes are more or less the same. Um, what is new, or what was new with ISIS or Daesh uh, is that we have an even more arbitrary uh, interpretation of Salafist ideology. We have, even, uh, we have more brutality. Uh, we have the, the utopia of the immediate establishment of the caliphate, mm -hmm. which is rather a long-term goal for, for Al-Qaeda, but a very short-term goal for ISIS. Um, and we have the 
an intense mobilization of fellows around the globe, meaning, for example, the terrorist fighters coming from Europe to Syria mm -hmm. or to, to Iraq. Different races, different languages. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Um, it hasn't occurred to that extent with Al-Qaeda, you know. Um, and importantly, of course, uh, a change of distribution channels for their propaganda. ISIS very much uses uh, social media mm -hmm. to distribute their ideology, to distribute its ideology. So um, we saw that there wasn't a huge shift in, moti in motivating uh, factors, but a, a change in the way terrorism itself unfolded, a change in strategy, meaning the media strategy yep. and so on. Um, and as ISIS have been, ha has been defeated territorially, mm -hmm. there could be a greater shift to the online territory or online sphere, yep. meaning the interruption of power plants and so on. Um, Cyber terrorism moving right, towards. Yeah. Right, yes. Uh, or an increased cooperation, and this is a very important point, with uh, organized crime, especially regarding the financing of terrorism. Mm -hmm. As ISIS has lost a lot of has lost its territory, it isn't able to uh, to generate that income okay. that it was able to generate before, yep. and so it has increasingly stick to uh, order to use to or to cooperate with uh, criminal gangs mm -hmm. and so on. Um, yeah, these are yeah. So I would say um, yeah, this might be the changes, and um, of course, especially for ISIS increasingly sticking to uh, the character of an underground organization, mm -hmm. at least now. That may change, but um, at least now. Yeah. yeah. This gives a lot of room for cooperation between states on counterterrorism, because if the threat is truly global and everyone, while, like you said, each state faces unique challenges, uh, it's truly a global threat. So there's so many ways to cooperate. And over the years, while there have been calls for greater cooperation between Europe and India, um, it's still at a very basic level, like there's some training programs. Um, but what can we, why is it that there is a reluctance in intelligence sharing or there's no cooperation between intelligence agencies or money transfers? What can India and Europe do together um, to sort of counter terrorism? Well, as I already mentioned, um, apart from cooperation of a, of, on a governmental uh, level, I I cannot say much about a reluctance in information sharing on information sharing on an intelligence level, but mm -hmm. we can of course increase our cooperation on a on the, on an academic level um, because uh, the the underlying causes are more are, are the same, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so uh, at the Austin Institute for International Affairs, we currently are working on a project funded by the European Commission. Mm -hmm that uh, where we develop alternative narratives to counter right-wing extremism and Islamist motivated uh, extremism. So, yeah, the narratives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to, 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 to prevent the radicalization of the youth. Yeah. So possible cooperation would be to include Indian think tanks into such EU-funded projects and to adapt the findings on the Indian region, on the reach, regional Indian context. Mm -hmm. Sort of learn from each other's experiences. Right. And then sort of see what we can do right. together. Right, right. Because it is about grievance, feelings of grievance, oppression, and so on. So yeah. this is the same in Austria or in India. Just the regional context is different. Yep. And well, this is where I see a space for cooperation. Yep. No, absolutely. I agree with you that there can be, uh, especially with ISIS, how we've seen the different nationalities, different ethnicities, races, languages, uh, but there is plenty of room for cooperation given the global threat. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It was a pleasure.